Good morning, everyone. Uh, <clears throat> so today, uh, uh, I usually kind of know what the the message of the sermon is going to be about, and that's what I'll uh, use a lot to pick out my songs. But uh, today, uh, well, actually, recently, the last few weeks, I haven't known. Um, but. Uh, Kind of been following my heart, and, and uh, today, you know, my heart was just on grace, and uh, so I picked out some songs that um, are just reflecting on God's grace. And um, you know, and the thing that that really does amaze me about God's grace, you know, is just how He. Um, His grace upon us when we didn't deserve it, you know. Um, you know, when we were His enemy, you know, He died for us. And, uh, you know, so I'm just grateful for that love that He poured out upon us, for His grace. And, uh, you know, the other thing about God's grace that is so amazing and it changes us. You know, God's grace transforms our own hearts. And, uh, you know, it's the thing that I, I believe allows us to, uh, to, to be able to face one another. You know, sometimes we get on each other's nerves and, and we do things that, um, that uh, just seem unreconcilable, you know, but it's knowing our own faults and recognizing what we ourselves have been forgiven of, that uh, then, you know, allows us to be able to forgive other people, and, uh, and that's just one of the amazing things about grace to me, is just knowing what I've been forgiven of, knowing that God has forgiven me even in the times in my life when I despised him, you know, just reminds me that, you know, that grace is now expected of me to impart to others in my life. So, Lord God, I just pray that you would give us that realization of your grace in our own lives, Lord God allow us the power and the strength, Lord God, to extend that grace to others around us, Lord. And that that grace would transform our lives, Lord God, and make us new, to make us whole, to make us the loving people that you have called us to be, Lord God.
Welcome to the seventh week of our Shelter Time series. We're going to be uh, passing through Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16 uh, today. And, and we're going to get there. The title of the sermon is, uh, What Are You Here For? What are you here for? But I want to just uh, give you an update on Lighthouse as a congregation and introduce you to some, uh, uh, some new concepts. So we are going to be reopening as the, the governor has allowed us uh, with guidance to reopen. So in about three weeks or so, we're going to be reopening. Uh, the board and the staff are coming together with, and, and we're putting together a plan. That's one of the written plan is one of the things that uh, the guidance requires. And in fact, we are definitely in keeping with the guidance that comes from California. So we're going to uh, uh, adhere to those, uh, that guidance uh, very strictly. So if you, uh, th there's a couple of things that I want to say just to preface that. Like if you have any immunocompromised thing going on, uh, if you have any questions at all about whether it's safe to come in or whether you want to uh, take the risk of coming in or things like that. I want to encourage you guys like stay home. It's okay. Uh, we are committed to continuing this online experience. We've had so much great reaction and so much, so many really great things that have come about as a result of this uh, online experience that we're creating. We're going to continue that long term. And so uh, we do just want to uh, let you know that we are going to be reopening, but it's going to be very, very limited in the first couple of weeks. As you might already know, there's a lot of guidance that's come from the state of California. So uh, there are things like checking temperatures, wearing masks, uh, sanitizing things before and after services and things like that. Look, you guys, we are going to open, but it's going to be kind of a soft launch. We're going to have roughly 15 people in the congregation that first week. And it's probably not going to happen for another couple of weeks or three weeks uh, because we have to get the plan in place and we have to buy all the supplies that it takes to administer and be uh, consistent with the guidance of uh, the state of California guidance. And so, uh, so I, I just want to let you guys know that we're going to open as fast as we can, as soon as we can. And we're going to be uh, doing services in here for around 15 people or so. And that's going to happen in the next couple of weeks. So just be aware of that. We'll make more announcements um, on Facebook. And uh, we, uh, so we want to just let you know about that. So um, this passage that we're going through in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, is right in the middle of one of the most important pieces of scripture that exists, actually. It's in the middle of the Sermon on the Mount, and Jesus here is, is preaching this sermon to his disciples and his, and his followers, and uh, he is going to uh, draw out a metaphor or an analogy, and he's going to be using the terms salt of the earth and light of the world. And so I want to just unpack that for you just, as, just to set the foundations of the, of the sermon today. The salt of the earth, it's interesting that word earth that's going to be used in the passage that we read, again in Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16, uh, the, that word earth has to do with the land. So if I were to say to you the land of Israel or the land of Jerusalem, what you would take that to mean is the specific land that you're setting on or that you're, uh, you're in. And, and so uh, that, uh, uh, the salt of the earth, the idea of salt would have had a couple of different applications at this time. And Jesus' followers would have understood that salt is used as a preservative. In the Middle East at this time, first century, like there's no refrigeration. And so it's essential to, to preserve food. And so salt would have been used to preserve food. And you know, we as Christian people, as followers of Jesus ought to be preserving life and preserving and preventing decay. We ought to be seen as life giving. The other thing that, the, uh, that salt was used for at the time is if you have a wound, it was used to disinfect the wound. So placing salt on a wound, this is true today. It stings like crazy. It burns like crazy. But if you do that, it disinfects the wound. And so one of the uses of salt at this time would have been to disinfect the wound, prevent infection. You know, and our life ought to be like, like salt to the wounds of our neighbors. We ought to be encouraging healing, disinfecting, and allowing that body to heal. You know, it's not always pleasant to have disinfectant or salt poured into a wound. 
But ultimately, it's good for the recipient. It's good for that wound to heal and to be protected from infection. The next thing that salt is, and this is one of my favorites, as you guys know, I love food. So enhancing flavor, the salt just makes stuff taste good. And so th- th- at the time, the, the hearers of Jesus would have known very well that like, like salt is an important flavor enhancer. It makes stuff taste a lot better. And for us, you know, as followers of Jesus, our lives ought to enhance the life, the flavor of life for those that we come into contact with. So these three things are, the, are, the, are, are related to the salt of the earth. You know, the one thing that salt requires is contact, actually. If you don't have contact, salt doesn't work. You can bring like a, a cut of meat really close to salt and it won't change the flavor at all. But once you take that salt and rub it into the meat, it penetrates the meat and it enhances the flavor. And that's what salt requires. And for all of these to, to preserve or disinfect or enhance flavor, it requires contact. Well, there's another manner of ministry that does not require contact, and that is expressed here as light, the light of the world. And the word world in this, in this passage from Jesus would have related to like the known universe, right? It would have been like the sun lighting up the whole world. The sun doesn't have to come into contact with anything in order to shed light. And so light illuminates it ca- when it's casts on an object, that object becomes perceivable. And we are called to cast light and illuminate our world, the world of those around us, that they might perceive what is truly there. The other thing that light does is it dispels darkness. It chases shadows and dispels darkness and our lives ought to be a force that drives darkness out of our world our lives ought to drive darkness out of our world and darkness ought to run and hide at our coming the other thing that that light does is it accommodates sight you know your eyes are useless in pitch black darkness There's nothing that your eyes can do if there's not light enough to perceive. And so what our our lives ought to be accommodating sight, accommodating the ability to see things as they are. And so Jesus is going to use in this passage the term salt of the earth and light of the world. And I just want to give you that context before we read the passage. So let's go ahead and read the passage. From Matthew chapter 5, verse 13 through 16, we read this. You are the salt of the earth, but if the salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to throw out and be trampled underfoot. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this word. We pray that you be here with us. Help us, Lord, to internalize what it is that you have to teach us this morning. We pray that you use this time to make us more into your likeness. In Jesus' name, amen. Your life is intended to be distinct. This comes out of verse 13. And I want to just read this to you. You are the salt of the earth. But if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. You know, the truth is that your life is intended to be so distinct and so different. There is this pattern of the world. We see it everywhere. The pattern is is driven by things like lust and greed and pride. These are things that are the motivators of the world. 
And in fact, you know, I would just say this. You know, the pattern of the world is like really well-worn. It is well-worn even with Christian people walking that same path. If you want to know the truth about why I think that Christians have become so ineffective in our world, so bland in our world, so much like the world, is that we have taken on the world's priorities, we use the world's weapons, we use the world's methods, we walk down the world's paths, and we expect somehow to see the gospel take hold, but that's never going to take place until we reject the pattern of the world. Because your life is intended to be distinct. The human being is a complex bundle of emotions and neurons firing in all directions. It's flesh and bone, it's intellect, and it's spirit. The human being is a pattern-seeking machine. It's a habit-forming machine. And what we do is we run the same patterns, just over and over and over and over, expecting somehow that there'll be different results. But guess what? Those patterns will always result in the same thing, over and over and over. We've developed... Habits that look just like the world's. And so you look at politics, you look at the laws that we make, you look at all the fights that we fight, and you realize, man, there's just so much here that looks worldly. But let's think about Romans chapter 12, verse 2 says this, Do not conform to the pattern of this, of this world, but be transformed by the renewing of your mind then you will be able to test and approve what God's will is, his good and pleasing and perfect will. Most of us run around saying, this is just who I am. We might even justify it on godly terms. We might say, hey, God made us, God made me this way. I'm a fighter. You know, some of us are like all fight, no flight or all flight, no fight, <laughs> Right? So if you're a fighter, you know, whatever the problem is, I'll just scissor kick it. We'll talk about it when you wake up again, right? Like, like you'll catch an elbow, you take a nap, we'll talk about it when you wake up. But that's not how we're supposed to be. This is the pattern of the world. The pattern of the world says you find something that works and then you do it. Jesus never worked out that way. He never worked it that way. Sometimes he would be confronted by Pharisees and the crowds and he would slip through the crowd. And you might say, wow, he's running. His time wasn't right. Sometimes he would, he would drive the money changers out at the end of the whip. And you'd say, oh, look at that. He's angry. Maybe that's the thing that we should bring. Sometimes he would walk to the cross. Other times he'd walk away from the conflict. Jesus knew something very important, that the pattern of the world is not the pattern of God. You must discern the times rightly. You must live a life that is totally distinct from the world. Rare is it to see a Christian person of any ilk make the real arguments in this life. You know, you look at all of the big fights that we have right now over COVID, wearing masks, don't wear masks, go outside, don't go outside, people getting choked out and killed in the street, you know? You look at all of those fights, and you see people standing up and making all of these arguments that have nothing to do with God. If you want to know what it is that causes our problems, it is very simple. We've rejected the God that made us. But you're not going to hear that on CNN. You're not going to hear that on Facebook very often. Really, you're not going to hear that because Christian people have abandoned the path that God has given us. You want to know why the world is in the condition that it's in? It's because we have rejected the God that made us. And we desperately need to repent. That's why the world is the way that it is. But our life, the Christian's life is to be distinct. 
different. Focused on the actual problems and not the symptoms of the problems. The pattern of the world is so predictable. But you, you're a new creation. You've been given a new heart, a new mind. And your life is intended to be distinct. Your life is intended to change the earth. Your life is intended to change the earth. Let me read again, verse 13 again. You are the salt of the earth. Remember, the earth relates to the land, your neighborhood, your community, your city. It's not talking about, you know, changing you know, Palestine or Jerusalem or India or any of those places. We're talking about the place where you live. Your life is intended. You've been placed in your community to change the earth. So you are the salt of the earth, but if salt loses its saltiness, how can it be made salty again? It is no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled underfoot. That is verse 13. And I just want to just want to say this, like salt enhances the flavor of everything that it comes into contact with. That is what you're supposed to do. It, it preserves and improves the world that it comes into contact with. You are intended to make the world a better place. And you do it by contact. It has to do with everything that surrounds you and me. And your life is intended to change the earth. The family of God called the body of Christ was born for this purpose, sent into the world to literally change the world. And you know what? It has happened. The world is a lot different than it was before Christ was made. But we, in some sense, have become bland salt. If I look around at our culture and the things that we've spent our influence on, the things that we've... Here we are in this this culture where being Christian is really, really easy. And, 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 And we've spent our influence on the most worthless of things, in all honesty. I mean, think about the life of the Christian and how it's supposed to be distinct. If the life of a Christian is poured into a community, that community should never be the same. Think about the bowl of soup that receives the salt. It should not taste the same. And our community should not taste the same. And I just want to just say to you like I'm, I'm a lot of people think of me as an optimist and I guess I am if I'm if you compare me to other people I I've never really understood the value of being an optimist or a pessimist right to me that just seems silly like I want to see things as they are I want to be a realist right but by comparison I would say I'm probably more optimistic than most people that I come into contact with and the idea is that we were told to come into this place to change this place to change the earth. Colossians chapter four, verses five and six say this, be wise in the way you act toward outsiders. Make the most of every opportunity. Let your conversation be always full of grace, seasoned with salt, so that you may know how to answer everyone. This is our call. And you know, the truth is, we're not changing the world very much. In all honesty, we've focused on the wrong things. We've zeroed in on the, 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 the really minute details and missed the big picture. It's very rare to see Christian people who are strictly focused on building the kingdom. Usually what they've got is the kind of Christianity that says, well, I'm Christian in addition to whatever else it is. 
So it might be political. It might be, you know, uh, a, a law. It might be uh, any number of different, you know, your own people group happens to be your thing. But at the end of the day, we are called to literally change the earth. You have been gifted with the Holy Spirit in order to change the earth. Verses 14 and 15, we read this. You are the light of the world. A town built on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a bowl. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. And the observation here is that your life is intended to stand out as different. Your life is made. You're still here on this earth in order that you stand out, stand up, and be different. Different than everyone that surrounds you. Against a backdrop of darkness, you are to be a shining star. You are to be a point of light. You are to be, uh, to pierce this darkness. That's your task. Your light ought to shine over against the darkness that surrounds you. It should be distinctive. But we don't live that way. I mean, I'll just give you one example. You know, sometimes people will ask me about, um, you know, like gay marriage and stuff like that. And, uh, you know, I'm, I'm always a little, I try to shape, uh, the answer to that question, to who it is that I'm talking to. But, but really the truth is, you know, the, our problem with marriage started way before gay marriage was even an issue. The fact is that Christian people have given up on marriage. Marriage was supposed to be a promise, a covenant between me, my spouse, and God. This was what marriage was supposed to be. But we get divorced the same rate as everybody else does. And you know, it's amazing to me. Like, like, I think of this as just like so amazing. We've totally given up the ghost on this kind of talk. We feel very confident about coming against all of these different variations of marriage that are coming uh, to the fore right now. So many of you don't know, like, hey, look, uh, in like, I think it was 1970, there was a thing called no-fault divorce. No-fault divorce was basically this. You didn't, nobody had to be at fault. Before that, you had, you know, is like a covenant. Like, hey, uh, I'm marrying my spouse and we are standing in front of our family and our friends and we're gonna make this commitment, we're gonna make this promise to each other and if this thing falls apart, somebody's gonna be at fault. But that's not the way that we think about marriage right now. I mean, most Christian circles, you look around and you say like, these people are getting divorced just as often as the others. So this promise that has been made, I mean, it means very little. I, I, it just does. And so, I mean, it's one of the things that we, we need to realize, like, hey, look, if we actually think marriage ought to be sacred, then actually we need to be fighting to undo what was done in 1970. No fault divorce, right? Where you say, hey, look, we're just not compatible with each other. Nobody's at fault. What are you talking about? Nobody's at fault. You made a promise. What are you talking about? So I, I think what we have to recognize is this, that our lives are intended to stand up and stand out as different. That means we'll be making different choices based on different priorities. 1 John chapter 1, verses 5 through 7 say, say this. This is the message we have heard from him and declare to you. God is light, 
In him there is no darkness at all. If we claim to have fellowship with him and yet walk in darkness, we lie and do not live out the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another. And the blood of Jesus, his son, purifies us from all sin. You know, maybe one of the reasons we have zero effect on the culture that we live in, maybe one of the reasons that we're just uh, uh, completely, you know, neutered (laughs) in our culture is because we've given up standing up and being different. I mean, that divorce thing is just one of those things. I mean, if you really want to get depressed, if you've ever been a divorced person, if you ever want to get really depressed, go ahead and read what Jesus says about being divorced. That will make you depressed. That will make it so that you will never want to bring up someone else's marriage or relationship. And so I just want to encourage you this, like like for us, we're supposed to be different. Our life is intended to stand up and stand out. And maybe that's why we're so ineffective, man. Maybe we can't seem to get any traction because you know what the, the unbeliever says to us? Look, if you want me to redeem, believe in your redeemer, you're going to have to look a lot more redeemed than you do. And we don't look redeemed. We look just like everybody else. We're bland salt. In the words of Jesus here, we ought to be trampled on, thrown out. Right? And so the idea is, I'm not telling you this to convict you in any way other than to say, ours is a, our job is to stand up and stand out. Not for political opinions or new laws. There's no CEO or president or governor or mayor who's going to get us out of the fix that we're in. It's only Jesus that's going to do that. You want to get out of the fix that you're in? You better turn to Jesus. We've forgotten the God that made us. That's our problem. And your life is intended to give that message to everyone who will listen to you. Your life is intended to stand out. Your life has been given to you in order that you stand out and stand up and demonstrate That there is a life beyond this life. A life given to you by Jesus himself. And that we'll never come out of the fix that we're in without turning to him. And your life is intended to stand out as different. Your life is intended to be an example to others. Your life is intended to be an example to others. In verse 16 here, it says, In the same way, let your light shine before others, that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. Your light is intended to shine before others. Your light is intended to be there in full view of everyone around you. This means we can't be so privatized and locked away. This means that faults and all, we need to be living a pretty much a public life. And in the world, people are looking at us. I remember Charles Barkley, who's one of my favorite basketball players. He said at one time, I am not a role model. He was wrong. Of course he's a role model. <laughs> he didn't, what he was saying is, He didn't want to be a role model, but he was. People look to us. People are seeing us, and they're wondering if that's how life ought to be. In the same way, they were seeing Charles Barkley and and seeing what he was doing. What he was saying is, I'm not a good role model. Please, don't look at my life. Many, many of us feel that way. Like, hey, don't look at me. I, I, you know, I, I don't want to be a role model the truth is that we all are role models, especially you as Christian people. You are a role model. You have a profile that exists and people are looking at you to see if what you say matches what you do because the world can pick out a hypocrite pretty quickly. 
I mean, that's just the truth. And when our actions are not aligned to our thoughts and what we say, the world sees that. So you may be like Charles Barkley. I don't, I don't, I don't, I don't want to be a role model. Tough. You're a role model. <laughs> Tough. I'm sorry to say it. People are looking at you. In the world, when they look at Christians, they pretty much see exactly what they see in the rest of the culture, and that's why we've lost our salty, saltiness. That's why people are abandoning the church. Because honestly, we haven't given them something to cling to. We haven't given them something to look to. Paul himself said, look at me and follow me as I follow Christ. And what he was not saying, he's not trying to be arrogant. What he was saying is, look, if you don't know what this Christian life is supposed to look like, look at me as I follow him. And that's something that I think we have to just remember, like our lives are intended to be lived in front of other people. Sometimes our faults and our failings and everything, like all of that stuff, there's a transparency that has to be there in order for people to see something worth following. Philippians chapter 2, verses 14 through 16 say this, and this gives you a sense for what this should be like. Do everything without grumbling or arguing so that you may become blameless and pure. Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. How many of you know, like the generation that we live in? Pretty warped, pretty crooked. Pr pr pretty crooked. <laughs> Children of God without fault in a warped and crooked generation. Then you will shine among them like stars in the sky as you hold firmly to the word of life. And then I will be able to boast on the day of Christ that I did not run or labor in vain. You know, here Paul is speaking to the people that he's brought to Christ. He's speaking to the Philippian church and he's, he's encouraging them along and telling them that their lives ought to stand out like stars in a night sky. I grew up in Phoenix, Arizona. You know, there's nothing better in terms of a night sky than the desert night sky. You go out to the desert, like away from the city lights, make it on a new moon, right? Where there's no moon in the sky. And you look up on a clear night and it's just, you can see the entire Milky Way across the sky. It's just amazing. And that's how we ought to stand up in contrast to this darkness, points of light in contrast to this darkness. And the things of our life are intended to be examples to others. But people look at us and they don't see any difference between their life and ours. They just don't. And so, but but the, the, the life of the Christian person, the life of the disciple of Christ is intended to be an example is intended to be lived transparently in front of other people, warts and all. I, I like the humility of a, a guy called G.K. Chesterton. This one time he was responding to a news article that said, what is wrong with the world? The news article asked, what is wrong with the world? G.K. Chesterton in his own just great way says this, in response to your question, what is wrong with the world? I am, he says. Maybe the most brief response that you can get. What's wrong with the world? Me. So we talk about living transparently in front of people, and that means this. I need to repent. In this warped and crooked generation, where I've looked a lot more like them and been influenced a lot more by them than they've been influenced by me. I need to repent. I need to be willing to say like, hey, these are my faults and failings. And if you want to know what's wrong with the world, look at me.
but we bring people to the place of repentance. We give them a life worth looking at, an example to be shown to others. In this crooked and warped generation that we live in, how many Christian people are just not willing? Look at like look at the look at your Facebook. Look at the the the, the news stations. These professing Christian people. How many of them standing up and saying, "You know what the problem is? You are the problem, and me, I'm the problem. I'm responsible for this." Not many of us are willing to live that way. It's distinctive. It's different but it is exactly what we're called to do. We should be repenting on behalf of our nation. We should be repenting on behalf of the people that have walked away from the God that they say they love. And your life is intended to be an example to others. Well, there are four things that I want you to take from today's message. Four things that your life, I think, are intended to be about. And we take this straight from Matthew chapter 5, verses 13 through 16. The first is that your life should enhance the flavor of the world. The flavor of the world should be just different. We should not pour our lives out. You know, Paul himself talked about pouring his life out and becoming an offering. And that's really what we're all doing. We're pouring our lives out. And the, 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 the idea with our existence is that our life should enhance the flavor of the world. The world should taste better. Life should taste better for the people around us, for the people that come in contact with us, for the people who we are attempting to influence with this gospel of Christ Jesus. It should taste better. A lot of us are running around making life taste bitter for people. And it shouldn't. Life shouldn't be bitter. The next thing is that your life should speak the gospel of Jesus Christ. Your life should tell the story of Jesus Christ. You need to know like your life is here to be spent for the sake of the gospel. It's why you're here. It's the only reason that you're left in this earthly existence is to tell the story of Jesus And so we look at our times, the shelter in place time. We know this is not how people are supposed to live. We know that. And when we think about what the prescription is, we might say, oh yeah, I think a vaccine would be great. That would help us to get through this COVID thing. And you look at, you know, maybe racism or a person, a man being choked to death in the street and you look at that and you say wow what we really need is a law or a new leader and that's a symptom and you can deal with the symptoms but the truth is that we need to accept Jesus as our savior as individuals as communities I'll just say this as well as a church the, the solution to the pollution in our lives is Jesus. And our lives should tell the story of Jesus in such a way that it becomes winsome and persuasive. It becomes the kind of story that people are likely to accept. The story of Jesus is really the reason that our life continues. We should be telling the gospel at every, ta- every chance we get. And your life should also shine brightly into the world. Your life should shine brightly into the world. You're intended to look like a, like a bright star against a backlit canopy. I mean, you're, 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 you're intended to look like the night sky with a single point of light. You're intended to shine brightly into the world. 
Are you shining brightly into the world? Or are you just using the world's methods and the world's ways? Are you, are you engaged in the world's fights and battles? Thinking that somehow if you change the law or maybe if you got a different president or maybe the same president or the same mayor or new mayor or governor, whatever, like that's gonna solve our problems. That's not gonna solve the problems. You are here to shine brightly into the world. And if you do that, if I do that, if I do that, then the world will be forever changed. Your life is here in order that the world will never be the same. Your life is here to change the world forever. I grew up in in Phoenix. Uh, My best buddy was a guy called Gabe Maya. Gabe was an awesome guy. And he, um, his family was um, responsible for a lot of the sidewalks in Phoenix to this day, Maya Construction. And, uh, and so Gabe's dad had this saying, and, and it was, uh, you know, there was some colorful language in this saying, so I'll, I'll scrub out the, uh, the colorful language. But it, the, the saying was, drive it, uh, drive it till the wheels fall off. Drive it till the wheels fall off. And the point was, you know, many of us don't get a chance to choose a lot of the aspects of our life. You know, where we were born, what family we were born into, you know, how tall we are, how smart we are. There's a lot of things that we don't choose, but we're all given this life, this life. And it's all that we've got. And it's like being given a car. And the idea is you drive it till the wheels fall off. And to them, that meant working hard every day. And that meant partying hard every day as well. And what he was saying was this. You got one shot at this life. God's given you this life. And if you pour it out, For his sake, the world will just never be the same. So your life should forever change the world that we live in. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for this passage. Thank you, Lord, for this season. Lord, thank you for this time in our nation's history. So many things, Lord, are falling apart, it seems, and there's so many things to be upset and maybe even depressed about. Legitimate things, Lord. I pray that our frustration, that our anger, that our divisiveness turns to something close to your kingdom. I pray that as we, like Peter, stepped out of the boat, Lord, and began to focus on the, on the pressures around him and the storm that surrounded him. He began to sink. And, and, and you ask Peter, you know, why didn't you just keep your eyes on me? I pray, Lord, that we are a people called for your purposes for such a time as this, that we would keep our eyes fixed on you, the author, the perfecter of our faith, Lord, that you have brought us to this place and you have called us to this place that we would change this entire atmosphere, this world, and that we would not be ashamed to say, Lord, that you brought us to this place for your purposes. You've made us for this time. Lord, I pray that your kingdom comes to this place. We open our hearts, Lord, to the prompting that you have for us. By way of your Holy Spirit, Lord, I pray that revival takes place in our own hearts, in our congregation. Anyone within the sound of my voice, Lord, I pray that they are encouraged in their faith, Lord, that they come to a true understanding and knowledge of you and who you are and how you are. Lord Jesus, we submit ourselves to this time. We pray that you'll do remarkable and amazing things and may the world, may this community never be the same once this congregation, Lighthouse Wesleyan Church, is poured out for your name's sake. Lord, it is in your name that we pray. Amen.